good morning, Grace Church. Happy Sunday. We're so happy to have you guys with us this morning, whether you're in the room or if you're online. Um, let's go ahead and stand to our feet. We're going to start this moment of worship and give praise and honor to our God. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms make way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises Fill me all over my life, all over my life. Will me remember when I'm weak. The fear may come, but fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. strength and you always will be I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life all over my life See the cross, to see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. Oh, my sin bought away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. Oh, my sin bought away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. I see the evidence, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. Oh, the promises, I see your promises and Let's sing that one more time together. Let's sing, I see the evidence. One voice. Because I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. Come on, you sing. I see the promises. I see the promises in the all over my life. I see the evidence of your goodness 
Church, if we see the evidence this morning, can we give them a shout of praise in this place? Can we thank you? Good morning. Go ahead and take a seat. My name's Clayton Hunter. I'm a partner in ministry, and uh, we're going to have an opportunity to show the evidence of God's goodness through us in our community. So the first announcement is for Family Promise. And if you've been here more than two Sundays, you know a little bit about Family Promise. And we have an opportunity this Saturday to participate. Uh, we set a goal of $1,000 to give towards Family Promise. And we are towards our goal, but we're a little bit short. So if you could prayerfully consider giving towards the uh, Family Promise Derby race, uh, we can have the opportunity to bless families that are transitioning from homelessness to uh, permanent housing. The second one is um, swag. And so some of y'all have heard about swag, and we have an opportunity for service project on May the 8th coming up. And so for both of these announcements or any other questions about who we are at Grace, uh, you can email info at grace, uh, gracefl.org. And so stand to your feet and greet your neighbors as we transition and we continue to see the evidence of God and worship here. Do that. 
teeth full the water so my soul longeth after thee you alone are my heart desire and I long to worship I'll sing that again as the dew so as the deep and is for the waters of my soul longeth after thee. Cause you alone are my heart, desire and I. To worship Thee, one, one voice we sing. Oh, You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. Oh, You. Desire and I long to worship Thee. Oh, I long to worship Thee, Jesus. You sing, you're my friend. Cause you're my friend. And you are my brother, even though you are a king. And I love you more than any other, so much more than. Let your voice. Oh, you are my strength, my shield. To you, may my spirit yield. And you alone are my heart. Desire and I long to worship Thee. Oh, You are my strength, my shield. To You. Desire and I long to worship Thee. Oh, I long to worship Thee, Jesus. Oh, my soul thirsts, my soul hungers. For more of you, God. Oh, for more of you, God. Oh, and to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. 
Oh, let's sing that together with one voice. To worship you, I live. Oh, to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Oh, my days, I will praise you. And to worship you, I live. To worship you. I live, I live to worship you. Oh. Let's sing you alone are my strength. One more time. Oh, cause you oh, are my strength, my shield. To you oh, may my spirit yield. Alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee, and I long to worship Thee. David sang that song in the Psalms where he says, as the heart or the deer panteth after the water, that's how intensely I long for you. And we gather together with sisters and brothers in a room or watching online every Sunday. This is where God reveals himself, but it's for the heart that he wants us to give to him. Uh, let's continue in this worship that we're giving to the Lord. And uh, one of the ways that we do that is by giving to the, the Lord his tithes and our offerings. I'm gonna ask you to be seated. I'm gonna say a prayer. And then we're going to give you a few moments to, to do that in the, one of the three ways that we do that here. <clears throat> and we'll bring some lights up so you can see what you're doing. Uh, just a moment. But uh, we want to say thank you for your faithfulness to continuing the work of what God is doing. Uh, I've said to you that I will keep before you how we're doing as a church. And last year in 2020, we were just blown away by how God was sustaining and carrying us. And then in 2021, we got off to a very difficult start. And I sent out a letter this week and, and folks are responding to that. Uh, that's the one thing I love about this church is that we respond when we know how things are going. So thank you for that. Join me in a word of prayer as we prepare to give our hearts uh, to the Lord in our offerings. Father, we do desire you. We long for you. We thank you for showing up and, and reaching us in that place, Lord, that nobody or nothing else can touch us. There's a place just for you. And Lord, there's a world that, that has not yet connected the dots and they have not connected with you. And so we pray that through the giving of these tithes and these offerings that you would use these in order to help us in creative ways and generous ways and sacrificial ways to get the message out through the work that this church is doing in this community and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, how's everybody doing this morning? My name's Rick Thompson. I'm the pastor here, one of the ministers, but we've got 500 ministers, and you're all a minister uh, of the gospel. Uh, God is good all the time. I was reading this week uh, from one of my favorite uh, commentators and authors and pastors, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. And he talked about a time when he was standing on some cliffs overlooking the ocean and saw this scene. We stood on the cliffs and watched as the mother birds swooped in from the sea with mouthfuls of fish. There must have been thousands below us, probably tens of thousands of young birds, all waiting eagerly, all screaming their peculiar cry. They were all jostling and pushing and falling over and scrambling about. Somehow, however, unerringly, the mothers picked out the single voice of their young chick. 
amongst, uh, uh, among the teeming, noisy crowd, they could find their particular bird. It seemed like a miracle. And I suppose that we shouldn't be surprised about that because, you know, we think all of the birds sound alike, right? Wonder if the birds think all the humans sound alike, okay? I wonder if all the animals think that we all sound the same. But a mother or father will recognize their child's voice, even in a crowd, won't we? Those of us who don't have much to do with the bird and animal kingdoms, Wright says, on a daily basis are often startled at just how much animals can distinguish between people's voices, just like their own species. To this day in the Middle East, a shepherd will go into a crowded sheepfold and call out his own sheep one by one, naming them. They will recognize his voice and they will come to him. The shepherd, after all, he spends most of his days, most of his hours in every day with those sheep, and he knows their exa exact markings. He knows their quirks and what they're getting into, what they're not, who's the leaders and who are the followers, that sort of thing. He knows everything. But what's more, they know him. They know his voice, and they follow the voice of their shepherd. If somebody else comes in and even calls them by name, they will not follow that sheep or that shepherd, they will follow the one that they recognize as the one responsible for me. They're listening for the one voice that matters, the voice they trust. And when they hear it, he won't need a sheepdog to, to crowd them. He will not drive them from behind. He'll walk away, and they will all, one by one, come out and follow him. I've seen it done. Now, when you were little, let me ask you this question. Could you hear your father's voice or your mother's voice amongst the crowd? Do you respond? Did you respond? Or as a mother or father, do your children hear your voices? Uh, I, it's funny. I'll be at a picnic or something, and, you know, there's all kinds of families there. And you'll hear a kid say, Dad, and about 14 heads turn because we're all dad, right? But then you listen, and you're like, okay, that's not my kid. I know my kid's voice. Do you know Jesus' voice? Have you ever heard the Lord speak to you? How did he do it? How does God speak today? How does he speak to you so that you know that's his voice and that's not another voice? I know his voice when I hear it. Wouldn't it be fantastic to hear God's voice? Lord, should I take this job or that one? Oh, that's easy. I want you to take this job. Don't worry about that one. All right. Thanks, God. appreciate that. Should I marry this person or that person? You know, and, and God tells us and he directs us and we know exactly. And some of you are thinking, well, I know exactly what I would ask him. What are the numbers for the Powerball this week? You know, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Listen, hearing the voice of God is not something that would just be cool or fantastic or pretty neat. It's actually critical. It's mission critical. It's, it's life crucial for those of us who follow Christ as our Lord and our Savior. It's something Jesus does for us. He trains us to discern the voice of God in our lives. Back before the crucifixion, back before the resurrection that we're, we're celebrating and we're walking in these days, way back in John chapter 10, Jesus speaks to them, and he uses the same analogy that N.T. Wright said about the, the birds and the sheep. It's in John 10, 1 through 4, and then also verse 27. Jesus said, truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way, well, that's a thief. That's a robber. You can understand that. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The, the gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. They, the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And then in verse 27, he says this, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So what does the voice of the Lord sound like in your experience? Just take a moment to think about, here was a time when I knew that God got my attention. He called me by name or he spoke something that only God, uh, I knew it was only God. You've heard God speak your name or at least get your attention. Uh, I have a friend from, oh goodness, a couple churches ago, uh, John, I, I'll just use his first name, and John's testimony of how he came to faith in Christ was at a very uh, dark time in his life. 
John had gotten uh, uh, hooked on uh, narcotics and then was dealing with some really shady characters to get his hands on this kind of stuff, and things were going bad in his life. It got so bad that he found himself uh, down in Palm Beach County on an overpass over the uh, turnpike, and he was going to end it right there and then. And as he stepped across to get position, he, he heard John. And he, he just, he did this for a second, and he heard it again, John. He looked around, and there was nobody there. And he knew that God had something for him. So he, he stepped back, and he just, he just wept. And he wept. And his testimony goes on to show how that he went from there to, to talking to people who knew, he knew that they were Christians, and he got his life together with the Lord. But it, it's traced to God using his name to speak to him. It's not always your name spoken. It's your attention arrested that, that I'm getting at here. So how has God spoken to you? How has he woken you up from a stupor when, when you've been in your own mind, your, your own agenda, your own world, and then something rattles in the Lord, he's there. And you're like, oh, okay, this is bigger than what I've been doing. Maybe you've been preoccupied of missing his presence that he's offering to you. We sang that song, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul uh, yearneth after thee or longeth after thee. Is that where you are? And, and you're in a worship experience. You're like, no, it's not, but it used to be. And so he's getting your attention in those moments. Richard Foster is the guy that wrote uh, Celebration of Discipline back in, I think, the 70s or the 80s. But he says in, in another work, he says, the heart of God is an open wound of love. He aches over our distance and preoccupation. He mourns that we do not draw near to him. He grieves that we have forgotten him. He weeps over our obsession with muchness and manyness, you know, the pursuit of more. He longs for our presence. Imagine that. God longs for your presence. I've always been taught to long for his presence, that we should, you know, desire nothing more than God, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, as Jesus taught us. But to think that God desires my presence, desires your attention, that's a powerful picture. God wants to open your eyes to his presence because you need it and he desires it. You need to know God is there, that he hasn't forsaken you, but he desires to spend time with you and with me, to be with you. And often it's things like our grief that blinds us or our busyness that preoccupies us so that we're not listening. We're not looking for the presence of God. So now Jesus rises from the dead. Here we are in this time period between the resurrection Easter Sunday and Pentecost, which is coming in May. These 50 days, and in 40 of them, Jesus is appearing to various people, the different disciples who had followed him. And he's confirming the things that he had told them that the scriptures had mentioned, but they kind of like were lost on these disciples until it actually happened. So when he rose from the dead Easter morning, there were several people who encountered him. One was one of the women that had encountered and, and followed Jesus. Her name was Mary Magdalene. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, and if you've got your Bible, I invite you to, to turn there. We're just going to look at the uh, verses 11 to 16. John 20, 11 to 16. It's the morning of Resurrection Sunday, Easter morning. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, or we might say ma'am or miss, in that culture, why are, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, Rabbi, which means teacher. 
So I want you to capture that image that Easter morning that happened in this one person's experience. Here is a grieving follower of Jesus, Mary Magdalene. Somewhere in Galilee, she had met Jesus. And according to Luke, 18, Luke chapter 8, verse 2, Jesus cast seven demons out of her, which is to say her lifestyle, the torment that she was carrying, the weight of regret, whatever it was that was on her, there were these evil presences in Jesus. For, however, we don't know how he did it in that moment. He called them out and he delivered her from her burden. And she was a free woman. She loved Jesus. And so she joined the band of disciples and followed Jesus wherever he went, ending up at Jerusalem at the foot of the cross when all the other disciples had fled. But, but think of this woman. I was talking to, to Bill uh, Irwin. Bill plays uh, guitar up here uh, for us, and he was standing back here playing the 12-string guitar. It sounded beautiful. And he said, you know, I remember at my grandmother's funeral, that somebody stole the flowers after it was all said and done. They stole the flowers. And how that, that just offended and hurt us, that somebody would violate us in that sacred time. But then he said, I couldn't imagine had they stole the body. Think of what Mary is dealing with here in her grief, that she's just, everything's been turned upside down. This guy that, that loved her and, and delivered her, and she knew that he was the miracle worker, and then he died. And so she comes to pour out her, her expression of love, and they've stolen, they've taken the body. I mean, how, how violated and how evil. And so she can't even see that he's right there. And he's looking over her. He's watching over her life, even in the grief that she's experiencing, that has blinded her to his presence there all along. And then he speaks her name, Mary. And in that moment, she comes alive. In that moment, she wakes up from the stupor that he has been here all along. Now imagine the emotions that are flooding over her, that he's not dead, that he's alive. He's right here. And what does all this mean? When Jesus speaks your name, there's something that happens in you. When he gets your attention, you're like, wow, out of all of the people in the world, he's speaking to me. Methodism, let me go off script here. This is not my notes here. Methodism was started by an Anglican priest by the name of John Wesley. He lived in the time of the American Revolution, the 1700s. He's in England. And uh, John Wesley, he, he, he was tormented. He was by trade, by occupation, a pastor, a priest. But he would say that he didn't have this relationship with the Lord. He gets on a ship to come to America, comes to Savannah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to convert the Indians. And then he found in his two years' work here that they weren't any more interested in the gospel than the English were. And so he's really disillusioned. But on the ship, there was this storm that threatened everybody's life, and everybody was freaking out, every man for himself kind of thing, except for this one group of Moravians. And they were sitting singing hymns to God in the midst of the storm. And he pulled uh, Peter uh, Bowler aside, the Moravian leader, after all that happened and said, I don't get that. Did you not realize we were going to die? And he smiled and he said, yeah, but if we die, we're in the presence of the one that we love so much. And, and he was scratching his head because he didn't have that experience until he gets back to England and he's at this, uh, Aldersgate Street is the name of it, he's at this Bible study. And somebody's reading the book of Romans and Martin Luther's preface to it. And he said on that day, he goes, there I felt my heart strangely warmed because this gospel that I had been preaching for all people that God loves you and, and sent his son that whoever believes, I believed in that moment that he sent his son for me, even me. And it's like everything else gets out of focus. And the one thing is that God is looking at you. And God knows your name. He knows your story. He knows you're grieving there at the tomb where, where it, this is so final. Death is, it takes the people away and he's watching and he speaks your name, Mary. Wow, that's when something happens. When you respond in obedience, you are following the shepherd who calls his sheep by name. This is where the Christian life is lived. This is the picture of it. Not knowing all the right stuff, not having your devotions in the scriptures. All of that's a part of it. That's good. But it's walking day by day, listening for his voice, for him to guide you, for him to prompt you, for him to comfort and encourage you. Let's take a look at a passage where a young man in Scripture learns to hear God's voice. He's being trained 
to hear the voice of God so that we can learn some things about what it means to learn to hear the voice of God. So go back in the Old Testament to 1 Samuel. And as you're looking in 1 Samuel chapter 3, we're going to read from chapter 3. Let me set up the scene here. There's a woman who's married to a man. The man's a priest. And uh, once every so many years, he gets the lottery that takes him in. They're all in the system, the lottery system, where they show up, and they are the ones who conduct the services in the temple. And so it's his turn to do that. And, and while he's doing his thing, she's outside the tabernacle. She's praying to God because she can't have a child. And as a mother, it's in your heart. For, for a lot of women, it's in your heart. I, I want nothing more than to have a child. And when you can't, the frustration, the, uh, it, just the, the, wow, this is just not fair. It's unfair. And the longing that goes unmet, it can be unbearable. And so she's on her knees outside the tabernacle. The priest, uh, Eli, is sitting right there. And she, as she is uh, praying, she's not making any noise. She's just moving her lips. And he mistakens her for being a drunk woman. And he tries to run her off. How long will you love that wine of yours? Get it out of your system and get away from here. And she goes, oh, no, no, no. My heart is broken within me. I, I want a child more than anything. And I promise the Lord that if he will grant me my heart's content, my heart's desire, I will give the child back to him. I will dedicate my child to the Lord. And so then he realizes, oh, okay. So Eli says to the woman, go, may it be done to you according to your prayer. And within a year, she has a baby. What a year. You know, she gets pregnant. She couldn't have him. And here it is. And, and, and so she has this child. And so she nurses that baby. She grazes that baby until the child weans. And that culture, I looked it up, is between three and five years old. You're nursing your baby, okay? Three and five years old. Some of you can't imagine that. I'm not going to talk about my family because we nursed our kids for a long time. But in any case, here's the deal. She has the baby weaned, three years old, four years old, five years old. She takes the child to Jerusalem and gives the child, not just dedicates, and, and you know, I'm going to pray a dedication and then take my child back home. Uh-uh. She gives the child to Eli the priest, says, raise my boy here in the tabernacle. I will bring him clothes. I will visit him. But I promised the Lord that he would raise him. So th this is this child. His name is Samuel. According to the Jewish interpreters of all of this and the, the, the other scriptures that they have or the other uh, writings that they have, Samuel's about 12 years old when this happens here. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, 1 Samuel 3, 7. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So the Lord had been speaking to him. He's, he's laying down in bed at night and he hears his name, Samuel. So he gets up and he goes to Eli the priest. He says, here I am. Uh, you called me. He goes, I didn't call you. Go back to bed, son. And so, all right. So he goes back to bed second time. And so here he goes, this happened. And on the third time, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized it was the Lord calling the boy. The Lord was speaking his name. So Eli prepared him. He told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, say these words, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Position yourself to receive what he has for you. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there. He, he had been there all along, but now he reveals himself to Samuel, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Now we're not going to get into what he had to say. It was a word for Eli. Eli had been a wicked priest. His sons had been unruly. They'd done all kinds of profane things. And so God had said, this is the end of his line. He, I'm going to bring that to a close. But he revealed that to Samuel in the dream or in the vision. From this passage, we learn some things about hearing the voice of God. I want to unpack some of these things, okay? The first thing, and you might want to write these things down. This is helpful. This is not exhaustive. But just from this passage, I'm going to draw out some things that God teaches us about hearing the voice of God, which is mission critical. It's life crucial. Hearing the voice of God, first of all, it's personal. Write that down. Hearing the voice of God, it's personal. Samuel, Samuel. He's calling my name. Moses, Moses, take off your sandals for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Mary. Charles Stanley, 
Some of you love listening to Charles saying, I love, he's a teacher. I love this guy. He says, if you read the Word of God only as a narrative and you sort of exclude yourself from the environment, you're just talking about something that happened years ago, you'll miss God's personal message in your life. So read asking this question, God, what are you saying to me? Every time you read the Scriptures, every time you come devotionally or in study or listening in a time like this, ask God, you have a word for me. There's a general truth that you're teaching me, and that's awesome, that's great, but, but why am I hearing this now? God is person. You are person. You are made in the image of God, and He connects this person to person with us. It's different than the way he talks to the birds or to the dogs, to the trees, the rocks, the hills, the water. To you and me, he speaks. He speaks a word so that we will hear. When God speaks to you, it is a personal word and message. He has his eye on you. He's standing right there. He knows your circumstances. He knows what you are going through. So he comes to you, to you personally, with a word for you. What is that word? Mary was hurting. She was grieving. Maybe she was even mad at what they were doing to Jesus' body. All of these emotions are are right there. But she was not present to what was going on around her. How could she be? She was blinded by her grief. She was blinded by what she had lost. She was blinded by what these people had done unjustly. She was trying to figure out how she was going to handle all this. But Jesus was watching over her the whole time. And it wasn't until he said her name that she awoke, Mary. Wait a minute. Everything's different than I experienced. Everything's different than what I thought was really going on here. God cares for you. God cares for what it is you're going through. That's not my word. That's his word. He's watching over you. He knows your name. And he comes to you in your grief. He comes to you in your pain because he loves you. He loves me. I feel my heart strangely warm because he loves me, even me. He comes to you in your grief and pain and your lostness, and he speaks your name personally. So that's the first thing. He's personal. Second, be expectant. Be receptive. Be on the lookout for what it is that God is speaking. Position yourself to be actively listening and ready to respond. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. When you show up in prayer, expect that God has a word for you. We think of prayer as me, talk, 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 talk. No, 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 no. Take time to enter into that presence of God. And as you speak words of thanksgiving, starting off with God and how awesome he is and the things that you're grateful for, you know, as you take time to just go there in a conversation, I I try to help people make this real by bringing a chair out there, an empty chair, and just picture Christ sitting there in the chair and you're having a conversation with him. You don't have to speak flowery words and the words that the pastor uses and all of that kind of stuff. Just talk as he's your friend, he's your brother. And as you do that, give time to just think and just sit and be quiet. And the Lord will prompt, the Lord will speak. The Lord will say something to you. He'll guide the conversation. He'll guide the prayer. So when you show up in prayer, expect God as a word for you. Become desperate to receive guidance and counsel. Maybe you're positioning yourself to hear and receiving a word for God because you have a decision that needs to be made, and, and you're in knots over this. You're not sure what to do, how to handle this. Come expecting, he's got something for me. Or when you show up to church to worship, on a Sunday morning, for example, come expecting a word from God. Maybe you're watching online and you're not here presently yet, and, and I love that things are thawing and the vaccine is out and more and more people are feeling comfortable coming together. And, we're, and I'll just tell you that in June, we're targeting to open our 8 o'clock traditional service again in the chapel. So that we'll have two services going on, one over there and one here uh, on a Sunday morning. But when you come, come expecting that God's got a word. He's going to speak to me so that when you leave, you can say not just, hey, that was a great teaching or something, I'll log away. But you'll ask yourself the question, God, what was it that, that you want me to take? Because you have something for me today. What if every time you came to worship, you expected God is going to speak? If we just go through the motions, if we just go through the rote prayers and the rote worship and the routines that we've always followed, what are the odds of hearing God? Probably very slim. But if we prepare ourselves as the boy Samuel did, that when God shows up, you say, hey, I'm ready to hear, speak, I'm listening. And just by the way, that word listening doesn't mean I'm just listening to hear what you say. To say that I'm listening means I'm, I'm listening. You got my attention. You, you want me to jump? How high? 
because I'm, I'm obeying what it is that you are calling me to do. In Jeremiah 29, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, he, he's facing all these false prophets. And he's looking at his people that are just, they're, they're listening to these people who are telling them what they want to hear. It's almost like these, these people are like politicians. Put their finger in the air, see which way the wind is blowing, say, hey, God's over here. We're going this way. And so they're listening to the people to dictate what they say. And they'll say things like, I had this dream. Okay, come, come listen to my dream. I think God's in this. And, and God's up there just angry, just angry. So in Jeremiah 29, 18, he says, For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and hear his word? Who has paid attention to his word and obeyed? If they had really stood in my counsel, they would have enabled my people to hear my words. They would have turned them from their evil ways and their evil deeds. That's a word to the prophets of God's people given to speak to his people. It's a word that I take very seriously as a pastor, as a shepherd. That I don't stand here and waste the time of people by just babbling. But God, you've got a word this Sunday. What is that word? I need to hear that word so that I can be faithful to give that word because that's what you're connecting with in the hearts of your people. To stand in God's counsel so I can hear what he's saying and speak it to his people. What if every time you open the scriptures? What if every time you knelt in prayer? What if every time you lifted your voices and your hands in worship, you said, God, I'm here in your counsel. Speak, your servant is listening. This is why it's important we start with God, what God is doing, and not just with where we are. It's okay to be hurting. It's okay to be confused and confounded and to be busy and preoccupied, but we've got to stop and take a deep breath and be still and know that I am God. God is at work. He's on mission. He has a plan he's working out. When we listen in on what God is doing, we receive instructions. We receive guidance. We start to get perspective, and we, our, our eyes are lifted like Mary wow, he's alive. What does this mean? Be expectant and receptive to hear the voice of God. The third thing, hearing the voice of God, it's specific. God doesn't speak in generalities. He speaks specifically a word that you or I need to hear. He brings a specific word of what he's doing or what he's wanting to do, what his plans are. And he calls you and me into those plans. He, he reveals, he opens our eyes to see what it is that God is up to. God revealed to Samuel a specific message about Eli the priest and, and his family. That this is the end of the line for Eli. Strike three and he's out. I mean, I, I've warned him, I've warned him, I've warned him, and he's just not responding. And so I'm going to take the priesthood away from Eli and give it to somebody else. That was a word that he gave to Samuel. When God speaks to you, it's not just mumbo jumbo. So you can tell people, you know, I heard God speak, or I had this dream. I think God was in it. It's often an answer to your prayers. You've been asking God to help you in your finances. You've been asking God to help you in your relationship with your child or with your spouse. You've been asking God for, at your job. And, and so God, when he speaks, he has an answer for your prayers. It, it's sometimes a word revealing his plans about what he's doing and something he wants you to know and to act on. I remember very vividly a time in my life when, when there were people in my circle who were turning on me. And it's, at first, you don't see it, and you don't understand it. You, you don't experience that. That's not what you're used to. You're like, what's going on here? And then, you know, there were not, not a few people that were turning on me. And so my first question is, God, is this me? Am I doing something? that? And, and God, every morning, took me to scriptures. I wasn't seeking these out. He took me to scriptures that talked about my enemies, talked about that there are enemies, that there are people who will stand against you. And there are people who stand against God. And then sometimes he's saying, like he said to Isaiah, don't, don't be discouraged. They're not mad at you. They're mad at me. But you represent me. And so he was taking me. And so I felt like a very personal, very specific instruction from God in my own personal devotions that he was helping me. And he's done the same for you in different ways where you've needed a word and he has taken you there. And you're like, I wonder why this keeps coming up. Because God's encouraging you. God's comforting you. The voice of God speaking is a personal word, and it's a specific word you need. It's a specific word God has for you. How comforting is that? How encouraging? He knows your name. You remember Moses at the burning bush? I'll just touch on this. Moses sees this bush on fire, but it's not consumed, and it gets his attention. And he goes up, and, and God says, Moses, Moses, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. So he does. 
And then God reveals to him what he's doing. Here's my plan. My people are hurting. They're suffering. And so they need a deliverer. That's awesome. You're the deliverer. <laughs> That's not so awesome. And so Moses goes into this like four or five different excuses that he throws out. Uh, you got the wrong guy. You're knocking on the wrong door. I, it's not me. Who am I? And at each turn, God gives him a word of assurance. Who am I? I will be with you, God says. What if they say, who sent you? What is his name? Tell them I am has sent you. I am the great I am. Tell them that that. What if they don't listen? They don't believe me. What is that in your hand? It's a staff. Throw it down on the ground. He throws it down. It turns into a serpent. It turns to a snake. Pick it up. Oh, okay. He picks it up. Turns back into a staff. I'm going to send you with signs and wonders. All right? It's going to be good. But I'm not eloquent. I, I, I can't speak, you know. I'm the wrong man for the job. Who gave God, man his voice? Who gave man his lips, his tongue? It's not me. I will help you. Your brother Aaron, he can speak. He'll go along. And so at every turn, he's comforting. He's encouraging. Whatever the excuse is, whatever the inadequacy is, God's word is, oh, no, no, I'm here with you. I'm here the whole time. Over and over, Moses claims he's not the man for the job. He's not up for what God's asking of him. And over and over, God brings a specific word that encourages him. He will do the same for you. And that's what he did with Mary at the tomb. He said, go to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to my God and to their God, my father and their father. They'll meet me out in Galilee. And so she does. And she goes and she re tells them. They didn't believe her, but she told them, I've seen the Lord. And this is what he had to say. She was encouraged by his word to her. It made all the difference. Here's another thing. It's not always for you. It may be personal. It may be specific. It may not be for you at all. And sometimes God will give you a word to take to somebody else because they're praying, because they're desperate. They're confounded, and their stomach is in knots over a situation, and God speaks through you. I was talking to my friend Curtis yesterday. He and I are building a treehouse for my girls. It's going to be amazing. We should be done in July of 2024. But it's going to be awesome when it's done, right? We're weekend warriors. And so uh, he was talking and he said, you know, honestly, God speaks to me mostly through other people. You know, it, yeah, he does speak to us directly. He does speak in his word, of course. But we overlook how many times God brings a word to this person. And when they're just sharing with us something that they said that they read in scripture that week is what I needed to hear right now. Thank you for that. That's God's word. And that's truth. I take that. Sometimes God speaks this word that's meant for another person altogether. In 2 Samuel 7, the story of David and Nathan, that night the Lord said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David that I say to him such and such. Nathan told David everything that God had revealed to him. David wanted to build a, a house for God. I'm, you know, I'm living in this house, this mansion, I'm, I'm so well off, I want to build you a house. And, and God comes to Nathan and says, go tell him. That's great. That's awesome. It's on his heart to do that. But it's not going to be for him to do that. It's going to be for his son to do that. And so that, that whole account. It's so important that we learn to hear the voice of God because he has a word he wants you to deliver to somebody else. You can be the answers to the prayers that somebody else is having because you've learned to discern God's word and God's voice. Somebody's going through a difficulty. They're praying for an answer and God speaks to you to say something to them. You may not know it. You may know it. You may feel, I, I think I need to say this to you. Or they're heading down a wrong path and God pulls you aside and gives you clarity and then you bring that to them and they're like, whoa, whoa, I needed to hear this. Or they're deeply troubled. They need to hear from God, but their grief is deafening their ears. It's blinding their eyes and God whispers to you just the word that unlocks the door and they said, you've got my attention. Hearing the voice of God is important for all of us as the body of Christ so we can encourage each other and reprove each other and give guidance to one another, all of that. Here's another thing about the Word of God, hearing the voice of God. It can be and it will be confirmed. It can be confirmed. God will confirm His Word. You needn't guess. Was that from God or was it not? Um, he's not playing games, okay? He's not putting us out there on a limb to trust that that's from Him if it's maybe not from Him. So He sends confirmation. You see, when God woke Samuel from his sleep to call his name that night and give him this word, it was a difficult thing that God said. In fact, when he woke up, Eli, the priest, said, come to me, boy. What did the Lord say to you? Oh, <laughs> you don't want to know. And he didn't want to tell him, but then Eli prevailed. He says, whether it's good or bad, tell me. And so he told him everything that was going to happen. God said that he's taken the priesthood away from you because of your your disobedience, your unbelief, your sons, and all of that. And Eli said, you know what? That is a word from the Lord. 
And so, so be it. May, may God do to me what, what he's already determined to do. Now, how did Eli know that that was the word of God? Just prior to what we read about Samuel in the temple, back in chapter 2, we're not going to take time to look, God raised up a prophet. The prophet went to Eli, sat down face to face and said, God's going to take the kingdom or take the priesthood away from you. God had already spoken this word to Eli through his prophet. So when we come to Samuel learning how to hear the voice of God, what he heard had already been something that had already been revealed. That's important. If God had sp already spoken this world to Eli, why say it again to Samuel? What was God doing in this account of waking Samuel by calling his name? At least two things. One, he was revealing himself to the boy so that the boy could recognize the voice of God. He was training him like he trains you and me. Okay? Secondly, he was confirming the word he initially spoke to Eli. So Eli would know this is from God. He's told me twice now. You see that? But in the confirmation to Eli, it was also a confirmation to Samuel. The boy could know what God had spoken was from the Lord, for the Lord had already spoken this word to a recognized prophet. He didn't tell me anything contrary to, then to what he had already revealed. Do you see that? Now, this is important. God's word will never contradict God's word. If God says it in Scripture, and then he says something to you, they will align. Because if they don't, then something's off here. God does not play games and he doesn't contradict himself. That's a principle of understanding the word of God. What he speaks to you personally, specifically, whether it meant to encourage you or somebody else altogether, God has already spoken in his word. When I was in seminary training to be a pastor, there was a guy by the name of Dr. David Thompson, and he, he used this word canonical dialogue, the canonical dialogue. What's that? The canon of scripture the 66 books of the Bible written by all these different people over 1,500 years. Picture them sitting in a big old circle and they're having a dialogue, they're having a conversation. And you come into the room and you have a question. Are we saved by faith or are we saved by faith and works? Paul, what do you say? And Paul starts speaking scripture of Corinthians and Galatians and Romans and all the places where he says, a man is saved by faith, not by works that anyone should boast. It is the gift of God, right? Okay, but hang on a second. James, what do you have to say about this? James says, if your faith has no works, it's dead faith and you're lost. What? That sounds like a contradiction here. You say by faith, faith and works. No, we're qualifying the kind of faith that saves you. Paul says you're saved by faith alone. What kind of faith is that? It's a faith that will issue forth in me being set in a very different place than I was before. And now I'm going to live this out in the way that I feed the hungry and that I care for the hurting, that I open my eyes to the plight of the poor. If you don't do those things and you just say, I have faith in my heart that God is, that's good enough. James says, even the devils believe that. The demons believe in God and they shudder. It's not enough to just believe in that sense. It's got to be a faith where you're entrusting your all into his hands. And so this canonical dialogue helps us to test the word of God by what various writers of scripture have to say. So God will not say to you, it's okay for you to carry on that affair because she appreciates you more than your wife does anyway. That feels good, doesn't it? And that's not the word of God. It doesn't matter how strong it is, the impression upon you. The word of God says, keep the marriage bed pure, unadulterated. You've got one spouse you be faithful there. God will not give counsel that he has made clear in his word that is not from God. Years ago, Betty Eady wrote a book after having a near-death experience or a real death experience, and she said that she was taken into heaven and shown all these things. She wrote a book called Embraced by the Light. Anybody remember this book? About 20 years ago it came out. The new age was up and going and everything, and here was a proponent of it. I remember a family member reading it. One of our extended family members was reading the book, and we were at the beach, and I said, let me, let me take a look at that. It's very interesting. So I started reading, and I started seeing point after point after point. No, no, no. This is contrary to what God says in his word. This is contrary. This is not real. This is not authentic. I remember this because I ran out of paper. I pulled off uh, paper towels, and I was writing on paper towels all of the scriptures as I was reading through this that, that was at odds with God's word. And so, you know, it became, this is a fraud. She's just trying to make some money here. She had this experience. It could be a very real experience, but even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light to deceive even the elect if he could. All right? And so I'm reading this and I'm seeing this. And a friend of mine, I was sharing this story, this pastor friend of mine in uh, St. Petersburg, and he said, you know what? The FBI, this reminds me, the FBI, when they study counterfeit uh, currency, 
You, you know what they don't do? They don't study all the different counterfeit currencies out there. I mean, they, they do. They want to be aware of what's out there. But they don't spend their time trying to look, because it's always changing. People are coming up with new techniques and new markings, new this. What they do spend most of their time is, is looking at the real thing. And under a microscope or a, a, a magnifying glass, they look at a $5 bill, a $20 bill, a $100 bill, or whatever it is. It, not five, who cares about counterfeiting a $5 bill? $100 bill, $1,000 bill, right? And they know that so well that when they see the false, it just stands out as, this isn't real. This doesn't measure up. And that's what God's Word is like. He has revealed it. He will confirm it in His Word. In John 6, 63, it says, It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh doesn't give life. The words that I told you are spirit, and they give life. When Jesus spoke Mary's name, it woke her from her stupor to recognize the Lord of life. The resurrected Lord of life was with her. He was carrying out a mission. It was the mission of God. He was carrying out plans that he had already made clear in his word. That's what the resurrected Lord does. He wakes you up. He brings us alive so that we can hear his voice. We need to hear his voice. So I wonder what God is speaking to you today. Not just in this morning, but in this season of your life. What is God speaking to you? Is it a specific word? Is it a personal word? Are you positioning yourself? I'm ready to hear this, Lord. I've got nowhere else to turn. So, so speak. Your servant is listening. I'm ready to obey and, and confirm this word. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says, that is why the Holy Spirit says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. The Lord wants you to hear his voice today. Don't put this off till tomorrow. Don't put this off till, okay, when I'm in a better position. He's speaking right now. Who's listening? I wonder what he's saying because it's a personal word. It's a specific word. And we need to position ourselves to receive it expectantly. It's not always a word for you. It's important that you capture it because somebody else is hurting. And they need to hear from God. And it will be through you. And he will confirm it. It will align with what he's already spoken. Hearing the voice of God is critical as followers of Jesus. As critical as a child hearing its mother's voice in a crowd of people or a bird waiting for those fish to come to their mouth. That's what he's doing. In Matthew 4.4, 4, we'll finish here. Jesus answered, the scripture says, human beings cannot live on bread alone, but every word that God speaks. That's what we need. We need the word of God. If you are hearing God speaking this morning to you, what we're going to do in our last four or five minutes here before we leave, is I'm going to open the altar for you to come and to minister. I'm going to ask the team, if you guys would come back out here and just, you know, play that song that we were, it says, I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking. God, you are working all things for good. And take time either here at the altar or in your seat to go to the Lord and to say, speak, Lord. Your servant listens. If anybody would like to receive prayer, simply hold your hands open. And we've got various people that will come and, and will pray with you.
everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Wow, miracles. They're all around us if we'll just look. And so as we transition and close out here, I just want to bring a few more announcements to you. And the last one, is, or the first one is partners in ministry. That class starts tonight. If you want to sign up, you can sign out at the information desk as you leave. And I just think about that class and how it impacted me. It anchored me here, gave me an understanding of what our purpose and plan is uh, as a body of grace. The last one is, this is Guys Night. And if you remember a few uh, months ago, we had Girls Night for our Grace Student Ministry. So uh, six o'clock, the girls are gonna be serving the guys, but we need folks to help transform this room so that we can be ready. So receive this benediction. Father, thank you. Thank you that the power of the living and resurrected Christ lives in us. And so may we be obedient to be like Samuel and say, speak, for your servant is listening. And I pray that before everyone tonight lays their head on that pillow, that they hear your voice. And it may be through people around them. It may be divine appointments just give us the obedience to go forth to do the miracles you've called us to for it's in Christ's name I pray amen